Well, 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 guess who's back? That's right, past pals and Foxborough friends. We welcome you to a currently live streaming edition on the first day of March 2024 to Six Rings and Football Things, brought to you by your friends at WEI Odyssey and 2400 Sports. On today's episode, we will talk about New England Patriots quarterback room extreme makeover 2024 edition, all the latest NFL combine buzz, including some sound bites and nugs that came out just earlier this morning from some of the quarterbacks expected to go in the top three, plus some other players buzzed about and mentioned in regards to your New England Patriots. Will they actually burn some cash this free agency? And of course, episodes five and six of the dynasty. Can we at least just try to find something fun about this very well-produced yet sometimes controversial New England Patriots program? It's your old pals, Fitzy and Hart, or as we like to call us here on the Six Rings program, we've got the Gridiron Grinch. He's at Jumbo Hart. And of course, the Foxborough fanboy in the house, your old pal, Nick Fitzy Stevens. Good morning, Hart. What's on your mind? I don't appreciate being called the Gridiron Grinch. I think I've been relatively objective and even, I dare say, at times optimistic or realistic this offseason. No. You people are the ones that try to paint me as a Grinch. <laughs> And we welcome to the chat box this morning, Joey Yzguire. Hey, hey, good morning, that? fellas. I what can't. <laughs> well, why is he a I can't. Now, did he have a typo when he put it in, or is that actually his name? You know, it's actually pronounced Shashevsky. It's weird. It's, it, the funny thing is, yeah, K-S-Z-S-Y-I-C-T. Shashevsky, exactly. All right, so uh, let's get things moving. Yesterday, Hart, um, uh, Oh, we big report came out yesterday from our friends over at Mass Live. Um, oh, yeah, very well done, Stephen Tower, regular viewer here on the program. Good morning, guys. Uh, I'm beginning to think it, I was too early to buy my Marvin Harrison Jr. Pats jersey. That's right, Marvin Harrison Jr., a no show today at his media avail at the NFL Combine. We'll get to that momentarily. Andy well. Wright again. Oh, yeah. Oh, hold on. Save that. Save that. Food for thought. Um, Andy, the big story, obviously, in Pat's Nation yesterday was the, the Mass Live report done by our pals Karen Garigian, Chris Mason, and Mark Daniels. Mark Daniels, by the way, take a lap, uh, but it's a victory lap, and have a beer on us because he's had an excellent week. Good week over there for Mark Daniels at Mass Live. Um, always, quick uh, side note. Yes. First of all, um, I didn't realize Mass Live's not really a paper anymore. I don't even think it exists. It's a website, but... um. When did they become the dominant sports or at least Patriots beat coverage in Massachusetts, New England at all? Right. I mean, Callahan and Kai do a great job at the Herald. Sure. We have a team of thousands over at WEI. Apparently there's another, uh, there's some other radio station in town. Eh. What? Never heard of it. Nope. Uh, the Globe, they've got like Chris Price, uh, Ben Volin, as they say en Francais. Uh, they do, you know, they do some fine work. I enjoy Chris Price's work. Volin, I, Volin gets trolling sometimes, but uh but yeah mass live uh mass live has been absolutely killing it yeah well because they've well karen gregan who everyone loves yeah. obviously. obviously she does tremendous work chris mason hey, Darren, that's you yeah. up there and i'm down here remember the gronk <laughs> oh karen hello karen is that you hello uh <laughs> how did you get in this box i have on my are, <laughs> this how where are you cat like gronk it's a zoom what, zoom that's what i do on the field when i catch touchdown all right zoom gronk, zoom, zoom zoom so uh, they did a great job yesterday with this piece where basically uh, I had read from Chad Graff and uh, Jeff Howe also from The Athletic who had intimated in a piece yesterday as well that the combine buzz with the Patriots are pointing towards selecting a quarterback at third overall. Look, it's you and me. Wow. And me and you. It's it's one of those things that I'm putting my phone up, but it's in there. What are those things called where it's like infinity? Uh, Yes, exactly. Yeah. See, my phone is now in my phone, which is in my phone, which is in my phone, which is in my phone, <laughs> phone, 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 phone. That's great for everyone listening right now that Andy was watching himself on a live stream as part of a live stream. Not that While kind. we live stream. Not that kind. Not only. All right. Kind. So the Mass Live report. Come on, focus here, people. Oh, sorry. The Mass yeah. Live report uh, that the Patriots are looking to entirely revamp the quarterback room in 2024, which is good news because that tells me that. High Smith, the Wolf of Ball Street, everyone involved in the higher ups, Gerard Mayo, watched the games last year and realized the same thing that we did, which is this is completely unacceptable quarterback play, having two super mediocre quarterbacks on a dysfunctional offense with no weapons and no offensive line. 
throw for just over 3,300 yards, 16 touchdowns, and 21 picks. Uh, that's not going to get it done in this NFL, this AFC East, this AFC overall. Not going to cut it. So the plan now, as uh, Mass Live outlined, is to A, draft a quarterback at third overall. This is the closest thing to confirming what we've all been debating and deliberating for weeks now, that they plan to sign a veteran and that they will likely trade Michael McCorkle, Mac Jones, sometimes this offseason, likely before the draft. So, Andy, and I ask you, I ask the audience listening now uh, and watching us on the various live streams, with things trending the right way for Jaden Daniels and his stock, I'm imagining that he's going to be gone at number two. So if Daniels is gone at number two, or if Caleb Williams kind of talks his way out of the top spot, what do you do and who do you think the Patriots are looking at at third overall? So I think they've accepted what I accepted a long time ago. There's actually three good quarterbacks in this draft. So sitting at number three and just taking the quarterback that auto drafts into your slot is fine. I think my hot take, for the 2024 NFL draft, because everybody tells me that all three can't be good is all three are actually going to be good. Um, that being said, this whole Caleb Williams thing is fascinating to me, a word we overuse in sports talk and sports talk radio, but it is fascinating to me that Caleb and Mr. Williams might be Carl. I forget. He's clearly a, uh, a QB dad, Todd Marinovich dad. There's a lot going on there. Yeah. Do we think that he's uh, now a quick a question Absolutely. back to that? Okay. Yeah. Is it, <laughs> thank you very much. Yep. Um, so we're not full Lamella. We're not full LeVar ball, but, and we're not baby Gronk dad, but like he's, he's becoming a thing, isn't he? He is absolutely a thing. Um, you know, you read the story in the athletic that when he interviewed agents, the questions he asked them was to find loopholes in the CBA so his son could get out of it in terms of going to the team that drafts him, in terms of having a four-year rookie contract, a fifth-year option, franchise tag. He wanted to blow up the CBA for his special boy, Caleb Williams, like the ultimate dink parent, in my opinion. Uh, I understand we look for our out for our kids, but there's a certain like reality to the world. Like you got to do what you got to do if you. Yeah. Go homeschool them. Take, ma start your own league. You you know, you want Caleb Williams to be special? Start your own effing football league. I don't care. Um, but the bigger question here for six rings and football things. Yeah, and, is, and by the way, may I also add, Andy, it is a privilege to play in the NFL. And this con these like these deals have been negotiated accordingly. They don't get Matt Ryan money anymore, like when he got like a hundred million for just being drafted. But like at the same time, you're gonna get taken care of. Jeez, that's the darkest comment we've ever received. Wow, holy smokes. I'm not going to share that one. No, but. I don't think we need to share that. Um, but from but a it's... Patriots perspective, mm -hmm. we have a head coach in Gerard Mayo who is a why guy. He's going to answer the why. You have the maybe most ultimate why prospect to enter the league, which I do believe is a forbearer of things to come. I think you're going to get more and more Marvin Harrison's and Caleb Williams that want to do their own thing, nonconformists and and try to break the system. I think that's coming more and more with the seven on seven culture that's been built. It's the mm -hmm. AAUification of the NFL. It's ongoing. But if Gerard Mayo is truly what he said he was, he's a new age coach who, yeah, back in my day, you could just tell players to do it and they would do it. Now they want to know why. I think all of this could be boiled down with Caleb Williams to he's a why guy. Why do I have to sign that contract? Why do I have to go to the team with the number one pick? Why do I have to play for a team I don't want to play for? Why, why, why do I have to give you my medicals? Why do I have to go to the combine? All That's right. That's right. That became a big thing. He doesn't want all these other teams getting his medicals. As a matter of fact, didn't, he didn't submit them, period. And this does Correct. this does beget the idea that if he is the modern, the, the poster child of the talented, gifted, always coddled, crying in his mother's arms in the sidelines, you know, at fight on stadium. F you that's fine. F you I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't Rod agree Mayo, more. If he's there at three. Take him and coach him. If you're the this... developer of people, if you're the coach leader of men that everybody tells me you are take on the challenge, take on the talent and do it. I wouldn't want to do it, but nobody calls me a developer of human beings and a, and a uh, great coach and a leader of men. No one calls me that. So Gerard Mayo, if you want to live up to your own hype and the hope that you have brought to Foxborough, mm-hmm. Take Caleb Williams and turn him, take the talent, manage the personality and diva culture and dad and find greatness. See, I think now there's a chance that Caleb Williams may in fact drop from the top spot 
overall that no, the Chicago Bears, the Chicago Bears be may the, say. That's my but, point. He may but be then on the don't the commanders, team. but the commanders, don't they then say like, oh, shit, we didn't think maybe. that there was any way that he was going to fall to two. So maybe he doesn't want to go there because maybe he didn't have a very good season with Cliff Kingsbury mentoring him. And now Cliff Kingsbury would be his mentor there. Maybe he pants hey, and pounced right. and all those things. Who, who got the? Saying. Isn't it your guys? Your boy, uh, your boy uh, is the. Isn't Waldron the OC now in Chicago? Correct. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, see, I'm. Not I'm sure fascinated to see. I'm fascinated to see uh, how this all shakes out. Caleb Williams projected to be the number one overall pick for well over a year. Now mm -hmm. could be talking his way, manipulating his way. Uh, you know, pettying his way out of the spot. Meanwhile, Jaden Daniels stock without even throwing, running or doing anything in a, in a tight shirt and tight shorts at the combine this week, his stock just continues to rise and rise and rise. And we can't figure out what to make of Drake may as well. I want to share this quickly, Andy uh, earlier this morning, the quarterbacks all had a chance to speak at the combine Marvin Harrison jr. Who was expected to meet with the media shortly after eight in the AM Eastern time did not show up. So the first question uh, here, this is uh, Jaden Daniels. He was asked what he would think about possibly being drafted should he fall fall at this point now to third overall. What would he think about playing for your New England Patriots? Yeah, it will be dope. Obviously, growing up and, and seeing uh, what Tom Brady did there, uh, six Super Bowls, you know, that's tough to live up to. But uh, it will be dope to, to come in there and, you know, see the success they had and, and help them get back on that track. Okay, it would be well, dope. See, and yeah, Bill hey. Belichick wants him, so it's a marriage made in heaven. So I'm in, so so I'm sold. I'm in. Tell me why I wouldn't want Jaden Daniels as my QB one under center for the NEP in the future, regardless of which veteran is shepherding him next year. So the first argument against him, and one of the big questions of the combine for him in the quarterback position is what does he weigh? Everybody's fixated on he's a skinny guy who runs too much, takes too many hits. You can't play that way in the National Football League. To some degree, I agree, but I also look at a twig like Lamar Jackson who has found a way. You know, again, coach him up. Utilize his athleticism, but don't allow it to be a negative. You know, the, the Josh Allen, learn when to run. Okay, it's the AFC Championship game. Put your body on the line, all in. Mm -hmm. It's week two against, you know, the Jets or whatever. How about we be smart, slide, get out of bounds, don't take hits. So the the size of him and the running style is a concern for some. I don't have that concern. Um, his accuracy at times can be inconsistent. This no, this uh, popped up to me when I was watching a lot of Malik Neighbors catches. Um, there's definitely slants that are behind him and balls that are miss, you know, not put in the exact window they should be. We're talking like the zero to twenty throws because they're, and I know everyone's going to talk about, yeah, you guys sold us on a bill of goods that Mac Jones was the most accurate passer in college history. Okay, there's a lot of short passes, and yes, he also had elite weapons. But Jaden Daniels was the highest rated deep ball passer last year right. in college football. But he also, if you go watch some of those, um, when Malik Neighbors is 15 yards behind the defense, I would have been accurate with my throws, <laughs> too. So there's some of that. Right. Um, speaking of which, just quick side note. I know some people are putting Malik Neighbors ahead of Marvin Harrison in their rankings, including NFL.com Lance Zierling. Um, I don't buy it. I think Marvin Harrison's the best receiver in the draft. He may be a diva. He's the son of an NFL wide receiver. I might expect that. He's the best receiver in the draft. I do not buy that. Um, but in terms of Jaden Daniels, I also don't buy that Bill Belichick had a draft board that had cemented Jaden Daniels atop the draft board in December or November or whenever the hell that reported thing came out from that woman who sounded an awful lot like Diana Rossini talking about how the Patriots love Jared Stidham. Like just, Oh, uh, had you ever heard of Bridget Con? I mean, I, I watch a lot of NFL network, maybe too much for my own good. Nope. I had never heard of Bridget Condon when Which all of a sudden, it's fine. That's that fine. doesn't mean she can't be that's right. Fine. She can't have sources. Like who the F ever heard of Andy Hart? Like that's fine. I'm not, but I don't hey, believe Terp, it. Save I that drop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't believe that Bill Belichick had this cemented draft board in December or sometime before he was fired that I love Jaden Daniels. I'm going to get Jaden Daniels. That's the plan. Blah, blah, blah. I just, I'm sorry. I'm not buying it. That said, I like Jaden Daniels. If Jaden Daniels falls to three and you're on the board, take Jaden Daniels. Guess who else I would take? Do we have Drake May audio? Cause I like his audio too. I most certainly do real quick. Mike Dickinson watching right now on Facebook. Six rings should broadcast live from the draft. I couldn't agree more side note. We'll be there for my bachelor party. Daddy sodas on me. 
Oh, I am so in on that. If I'm stone just, cold in a couple Miller lights instead of Coors lights, <laughs> it'll be Miller lights. Uh, and Andy, think on this one to get back to uh, right before we share some Drake May audio. Uh, Stephen Tower, is there a scenario in which Caleb drops out of the top five? Yes, hmm. he goes six. You think so? Uh, no, I think he goes. I think somebody takes on the challenge. And my bigger picture, I still say, part of the reason you hire all these young coaches is this to deal with young players to do deal with new challenges of mm -hmm. the NIL guy who made fives of millions, tens of millions, whatever he's made in recent years. Like C Caleb made 10 million. I know That's it's all very vague though. I'm not sure I buy all of it. Um, it's, it's a bit of an argument now with, um, why am I drawing a blank on her name? The Iowa, uh, basketball player, Caitlin and, Clark, Caitlin Clark. And how yeah, was it Darren Ravel said like, yeah. Oh, by going to the WNBA, she's going to lose money right. next year. He's, he's, he's getting in this pissing. He looks like me on Twitter. He's fighting everything that moves on his timeline. <laughs> um, <laughs> is he in line at the pizza parlor? <laughs> probably. He likes a good pizza. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, no, I, do I think Caleb Williams makes it out of the top five? I hope not. You know why? Cause even though I'm scared to death of him and his dad scared to death, mm -hmm. I would take the talent. That's my job is to make it work. He's so gosh darn talented. I got to find a way to make it work. And you need to nail this draft pick as well. And we hope that the Patriots are sold entirely on all three quarterbacks the other day. Uh, <laughs> or Elliot they can have another documentary, the Caleb Williams era in New England, the yeah. Winesty. <laughs> you know, actually, that was not terrible. Uh, you could stop. No, the Rodney Dangerfield and Caddyshack dance afterwards has got to go. However, that was actually pretty solid. Uh, but you're not rooting for it because that would suck. No, that would be a terrible, terrible watch. Great pun. Um, all right. So uh, I want to share this and we'll get back to Caleb Williams. I, I, I want to preface this with this. I haven't been into Drake May very much. The the tape is okay-ish. It's, it's, it's good at times, but I'm not really sure about the guy. And then I listened to him this morning. I got to, I want to ask this question. Audience listening, watching live as we do this. Are you going to be a bigger Drake May fan after you see this clip? Because I think I was at a quarterback these are big time organizational decisions so give me your yeah. best sales pitch why you should be somebody's franchise qb yeah i think i can do it all i think one of the things where you know i really can make a play with my feet make a play throw in the pocket um and you really just you don't want a game plan you know for me you want a game plan with me so that's the biggest thing good luck Jerry. thanks appreciate y'all thank y'all uh i gotta be honest when he said you don't want a game plan against me you want a game plan with me hell yes that was that's a bet that's a baller line right there I also enjoy the very Belichickian smile of I nailed the hell out of that line that my agent agent told me to say when they asked me how to sell myself to like he was so proud of himself for that answer because he knew people like you, you people were going to eat that up. And I eat it up, too. I like it. I, I love the the idea of it. I actually believe in it. You know, I've made the comp. I think he's Josh Allen. I think he has the upside of Josh Allen. He can literally do it all. Wait, who was who was Yahooing with you the other day? You and I think uh, Keith show, told me this. You comped him out to be Josh Allen, and someone else said that he reminds them too much of Mitch Trubisky. Uh well, a lot of people are doing it. Basically, well, that's because, just because he went to North Carolina, they're so that's... blinded by just a simple visual of a of a color, a jersey, a number, <laughs> and they have no idea. <laughs> Jeff Stenberg watching live on YouTube. Copenhagen sponsorship incoming for Drake with that accent. I <laughs> know uh, it's all about the Zins now, guys. You know those the Zins, like those little nicotine oh, yeah. pouches. Did you see Andy? Uh, there's vid there was video. I think Barstool had it. As Jake Moody was coming out to attempt the 55 yarder, he reached in his mouth and threw out a nicotine pack on the field, then absolutely blasted a 55 yarder. It's at least it's less gross. Like it's it's a less gross visual when they do that. Because I've had yeah. people do that right in front of me, like having conversations with them, and they take it out and like wrap it up in a napkin. And you're like, oh, that wasn't so gross. I don't love it, but it's not the grossest thing ever. Oh, here we go. Our friend Mike Dickinson once again. Thank you. This is quality intel. Uh, this is the bachelor party guy. I live in North Carolina. I watched a lot of Drake May. This kid is a stud, better than Josh Allen. Whoa, hold on. Somebody holler at Shime. Chris Shime is right on with his love of Drake May. He is a great athlete. Yeah, I just wish Chris Scheim had a little more of a consistent background. He also loved Ryan Tannehill, so and hated Joe Burrow. Yeah, and hated Joe Burrow. So like, but he some... didn't like Mac Jones. So I mean, it's but that's all. Oh, yeah. is it, Andy, We're all is right it... and wrong. We're all right and wrong. Yeah, I'm uh, incoming. Andy Hart saying three, two, one. Except for you, Fitzy, you're always wrong. So uh... no, that's Cadillac. <laughs> oh, he's not here. So I he's not here shot. to defend himself. Come on, um, but that's the whole thing. Like 
and it isn't a best case scenario that two of these three quarterbacks in the top become studs plus no. starters or eventually I think champion. all three, all three you really think all three can No, but I think there's a good chance. I think there's, I think they are all worthy of being considered for top five picks for being considered franchise quarterbacks. And obviously some of it will lie on something we've heard around, like the situation, the support, the talent around them. Like those are all issues that they're all going to deal with. Just like Mac Jones dealt with a certain way as a rookie. And then a certain way in years two and years three, just like Trevor Lawrence dealt with a certain way as a rookie. And then a certain way in year two. So the pieces around these guys are going to have an effect. But they, all three in my mind, legitimately have the potential to be franchise quarterbacks. And just because history says, oh, they, the third pick can't be good or the third quarterback can't be good, I don't care about history. I'm talking about these three guys in this draft. Ashley J watching live on YouTube. I really like the idea of trading back to the sixth spot overall with the Giants to take J.J. McCarthy. You oh. have McCarthy sit for a year behind the veteran. All right, we'll get to whether or not you think McCarthy is going to be a, a fast riser, if he can play at the speed of the game in the oh, NFL yeah. now or sometime soon. But real quick, Andy, uh, let's bat around a couple of those veteran quarterback names since, once again, the Mass Live report said the Patriots remake in the room, trading Mac Jones and his new no-look pass. They'll be signing a veteran quarterback. Maybe that's the key. He was looking too much. That, that's, that, that was it. Remember See, in Germany, he was looking right at the receiver and then just couldn't throw it there if he had looked away he would have got it there uh so which veteran court so i'm just going to throw out all these names uh for you the audience listening watching live and more you've got uh gardner Minshew, the mississippi mud flap you got nope. ryan Tannehill. nope uh kirk cousins who a new report this morning nope. says is likely headed to a massive deal with the atlanta falcons oh did you see uh, the odd switch on that no the odds went from like are we talking draft night odds? Like, remember when the Stroud odds yeah. went from like 20 to one at the second pick to like off the board? I forgot what it was, but it flipped dramatically yesterday. Somebody got wind of, of that. Early. So it's happening. Yeah, it seems certainly seems that way. At least the, the, the gambling world believes that. Okay. Uh, veterans. Okay. Joel Shapiro. What do you guys think about picking up Russell Wilson when he's cut no! free from the Bronx? Why not? He was good last year. He's a dink diva. If I'm going to take a dink diva, I'll take a young, talented dink diva named Caleb Williams. Don't you think? Don't you think that Russell Wilson, who believes that his Hall of Fame credentials now are on the ropes, if he were to go someplace like New England, remake his career, help lead the Patriots to a respectable record this year, mentor a quarterback uh, that gets drafted third overall, like this could be a pot. Like he may have been humbled at this point, Andy. Like everything out of Denver in the last year looks, the last two years looks really shitty for him wait that's your sales pitch everything looks really shitty for him so you want him that no, was your, he that also was has plenty plenty, plenty of wait, arm wait, talent hold on he, uh, all right hold can on. you give you me a good sales me. pitch russell wilson stats 2023 if only i had a high-powered machine that could give me uh his information right here this russell wilson I hope. come on russell wilson last year 66% completion 3070 yards 26 tutties eight picks was only intercepted on 1.8% of his dropbacks. Come on. Now, he did get sacked a lot, but Denver had a bad line. That's high level. He was playing very well before that they started getting into his business about, like, the you need to waive your injury clause. Otherwise, we're going to cut you and bench your ass. Like, Denver really effed that up last year in a big old way. You know who effed up his career? Russell Wilson. He became a diva dink. All right. Okay. So, I don't want him, unless you can sell me on somehow he truly, and I guess Sean Payton, you talk to him. I don't know. I, I no. I don't want any part of Russell Wilson. Jacoby Brissett is the type of guy I want. There's no questions about who he is as a leader, a character guy. I think he's probably aware of what his lot in life is. Like that's the guy. You want you want some a little bit of that Patriot way sauce or whatever cologne is left over, but also high character guy, plus level leadership and mentorship in the locker room on yeah. the sidelines. Everything about even if there are people with better arm talent, better 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 passers out there you want to go a little more conservative and of course he's familiar with tc mccartney and alex van pelt your new qb's coach and OC. part of the wolf pack oh hey listen a, an old wolf packer coming in to work with the wolf of ball street i am yes. in yeah no people yeah people do not want russell wilson in new england it's probably no. not going to happen will well, he get an I office can he use alex guerrero's over yeah. office when he gets there 
how many bathrooms will he possibly have? Okay, how about uh, Heave Ho Joe? How about old man Flacco, Andy? Also familiar with the people in Cleveland. Nice reclamation project last year, huh? huh? I don't hate it. Uh, like that, those are the two that I that I think really fit the mold that I'm looking for. That they they know what their role is. They could be starters for no weeks, five weeks, or the whole season, and I think they'd be okay with it. They're mentoring. They're good guys. I don't hear a lot of bad things about either of them. I saw firsthand who Jacoby Brissett was when he was here, and I have no misgivings about bringing him in. Um, I think that would be perfect. So that's the kind of guy I want. I don't. I don't want to have doubts about what is Russell Wilson? What, what is, what are his angles? What's he thinking? You know, you had that weird, uh, Keith brought this up last night. You had that weirdness with Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tua in Miami a few years ago where mm. like he's playing well, he gets benched, then he's back in. He wants the job. He was like blindsided. Like I'm sure thing. Flores would tell you that he kind of butchered that as well, though. Kinda. 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 <laughs> yeah. Kinda. I mean, yeah. he took an axe to do a like filleting of a fish, and all of a right. sudden he had blood and guts and no no fillet. <laughs> yeah, it was that was an absolute mess. Seems so. People are afraid. It seems that Flacco is too old, and you're not going to rekindle any of that magic. And also, he's best with the deep ball. And you had young, speedy receivers in Houston. I wonder what he would have done if Tank Dell was actually healthy as well. Because, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, this is Cleveland. They they got their asses handed to them by Houston. Didn't have a healthy Amari Cooper the entire time, but still played pretty damn well. I think, by and large, the the majority of the media, a lot of players, the pay, players to come, and Pats fans would like Jacoby Brissett to be that veteran quarterback. Most people would like Jaden Daniels. He's not going to be available at three. It's going to cost way too much to trade up. You need every pick. If anything, you probably need to stockpile them. So I think we all better start breaking down some Drake May action because, by by and large, that you got you got the Orlovskis of the world who say that he's not it by any stretch. He says Daniels is the best pick first overall. So, I mean, Which the, he may be. That's where I'm saying you can. We get sometimes where you know the JJ McCarthy's of the world get talked up or the Penixes and pushed up. We've had it mm -hmm. over the years. Teams force themselves into liking somebody or one year wonders or various things. I don't believe any of these three guys are that. You have two guys that were projected to be in this spot for multiple years in May and Caleb Williams. Mm -hmm. And then you have Jaden Daniels, who a little longer, different road, but the Heisman Trophy winner who was as good as anyone last year in his game. Now, simple offense, talent around him, like all of those things. Yeah, those are questions. You got to you got to answer them. You got to figure them out. That's why you evaluate talent. That's what you're literally what your job is, people. But what about the the ob obvious, as we look to wrap up our first leg here, uh, we'll get a couple of other Pats Nuggets to get to before we talk Dynasty. Jeff Stenberg watching live on YouTube. It's all about the big uglies up front. Fix that and you'll solve 75% of your quarterback problems. Dumbest argument I've heard in a long time, Jeff. Sorry. Oh, and I do podcasts oh. with Fitzy. Oh! Hey, come um, on. Hey, uh, he, he, Andy is an equal opportunity offender, everybody. I would just like to remind no, I just. Everyone. This is a theory that people pretend about, and it's just not true. It's the exact opposite. Solve your QB problem, and you solve 75% of everything else. And usually when you solve your QB problem, you know when you bitch about your offensive line? And I know you've heard me say this, Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. in the Super Bowl. You bitch that Patrick Mahomes lost a Super Bowl because of his line. You bitch that Joe Burrow lost a Super Bowl because of his line. I Still would got love there. to... I would love to bitch about losing a Super Bowl. I in these days, love to bitch about losing a Super Bowl. You could you could have just taken out lose a Super Bowl as well, but that's fine. Um uh, I did hear an interesting theory. Uh Chuck um Chuck Klosterman, uh the pop culture writer, football fan, often a guest uh, on the Bill Simmons podcast. He said his plan would be because if you put all your eggs in the one quarterback basket and that guy doesn't work out, now you're kind of screwed. What about trading back and drafting two guys? Like, what if you were to draft like McCarthy and Sam Hartman instead, and you try to have one, you have draft two guys, kind of like what the Redskins then Jeff, the Redskins you're off the hook. I, Jeff, you're off the hook. No longer the dumbest thing I've heard on this podcast. We have a new dumber thing. It's not my. I'm sharing someone else's theory. I didn't say it was yours. All don't right, be all right, I'm just don't you? It's the dumbest thing I've heard today. So instead of taking a shot at really talented people, hey, mm -hmm. PFW days. Thanks, Greg. There you go. Appreciate I thought you. that would make you happy. Um, uh, so you don't like that idea at all? Trying to, well, like I think I Sam Hartman blows. Okay, well, there we go. 
so no, I mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, Sam. You seem like a nice guy. You got a great look. You might want to go into movies or TV or something. Right. You're a handsome son of a gun. He's not uh, as handsome. I got to tell you though, as uh, the the quarterback at Ole Miss, who is a year away from hitting the pros, Jackson whose name Dark, is similar to your son's. I was going to say, of course he is. And can and I nil people? Can we figure out a way that I can order a goddamn Whoa. baby blue Jackson Dart jersey and not I'm have sure, to go to the dark web to do it? I, I'm sure I can help you out with that after the program. No, but I want a legit one, not a dark know, web one. I know. I know. Fanatics where like the it, number is crooked and his name made by hard or something. No, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the fanatics is spelled F A N A D I C S. Right. No, no. Like, um, if in case anyone doesn't know, this is what I, I fell in love with this guy earlier this week. So handsome AF fine. Oh yeah. Um, ridiculously good looking kid, uh, signs an NIL deal with a private jet company. That's a baller move. Then I learned this, his game day face paint. He does the left. He does the right side of his face. He does a black streak from his eye down to his jawline. And you're like, why? What's it? What is he doing? War paint? No, he does that because that's what Anakin looked like when he turned to the dark side in Revenge of the Sith. Okay. Like the force is very strong with this one. I'm in. Just find a game manager this year. Draft Jackson Dart next year. You know, Dart jerseys would sell through the friggin' roof at the pro shop. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I don't know if he can play. We'll see. I mean, there's some <laughs> questions about being in the lane, that? I just, I just, lane <laughs> Kiffin offense and and all of that, like there's some, right. you know, red flags, but he's, he's hell. If they go the route of some of these, uh, Jeff wants to draft O linemen, do different things. Maybe they'll mm -hmm. be looking for Jackson dart in next year's draft. Maybe he'll, or, or Ewers or whoever the quarterback that blows up next year and comes out of nowhere to be the stud is like, those will be the guys we'll be talking about. I love all the theories we're here for them. That's part of the reason why we love doing these live podcasts so we can engage and interact with you, the Pats people, the fanatics of Foxborough, and so much more. Uh, real quick, a couple other nuggets, Andy, before we get to the dynasty. Wait a minute. Uh, Did Greg, who is a great listener, thanks for the reference to uh, PFW, left tackle, edge rusher, safety? Excuse me? Who's throwing the ball and catching the ball? <laughs> you, we need wide receivers and tight ends, Greg. I appreciate yeah. you very much. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Andy, a uh, couple other things before we get to the dynasty talk, Gerard Mayo has now officially walked back the burn some cash. Now I think it's actually, we're going to save some cash or, or, or are they? I think it started with Elliot Wolf saying, you know, we may spend some money. We also may save some money this year. I think you previously said, and I kind of, I kind of operated under the idea that like, that was a sexy thing, a fun thing to say in his first live interview with WEEI. But you don't want to just telegraph to all the agents like, hey, guys, we have a ton of money if you need it. Or, hey, we're going to overspend for no good reason. Like, you've got the money to spend if you target the right people and offer them the money that they'll need to come and play on a team with a team on the rebuild. But you don't want to just say, like, hey, free money here and point a sign at the fancy lighthouse in the scoreboard. Yeah, clearly Gerard got his wrist slapped by Wolf, Kraft, some combination. I mean, I think... People took it too seriously. He was on a morning radio show. He was kind of screwing around. He was laughing, like having fun. And the reality is they have money to burn. They, they When J.C. Jackson gets canned, they're going to have $100 million to spend that they have to spend. They have to get up to compliance with the salary cap floor. But I, I would argue this, Fitzy. You know what was dumber than saying burn some cash? What was dumber than saying burn some cash? Saving. Mm-hmm. Who the F in professional sports? Hey, I don't even know how you do it. You can't save salary cap dollar. Like, you need to spend. You need to do business. You need players. What are we you just doing? had the effing report card. First of all, they've been lowest in cash spending the past decade. Everyone knows that they're, uh, I think the, the, the courtesy word is thrifty when it actually the operating word is cheap. And you just had the report come out where the Patriots were 26th overall in terms of player satisfaction with facilities, coaching, ownership meals weight room and they drop three spots they're 29th overall that is effing embarrassing oh yeah well hey you guys you, you bunch of negative media it's the chiefs were 32nd overall and they won the super bowl so who the f cares uh we do because gillette stadium is supposed to be the beacon the castle on the hill this is the team that went to nine super bowls this century and won six of them this is ridiculous these these facilities used to work there i'm there a bunch you can tell they're inferior they don't have a play. They don't even have a freaking daycare. People say the meals kind of stink. The weight room looks like something from Dartmouth High School. Come on, what are we doing here? Like, open up the pocketbook, spend some money, write some checks, burn a little cash, start rebuilding your football team. That's that. 
I know, Mr. Kraft, you build it through the damn draft, but you need to spend some money. So I think some of this um, is due to losing. I honestly do. I think it's easier if you're a player filling out a survey to be negative and, and give a lower grade than you might have a year before or two years before because you're losing. You're a bad football team, and losing affects the overall culture and mindset and everything. I would also say the idea that Gillette Stadium was anything other than just an average stadium and facility was always fake. It was a PR spin. It was a facade. It was uh, water being carried by you people and others. And like it, it's it's a die. And I don't fault Robert Kraft and Jonathan Kraft for that. They built it on their buck. They had to do things certain ways. I don't fault them for that. But it's always been. I mean, we even saw it as we transition in a little bit to the dynasty. One of the dynasty episodes where Bill Belichick's walking off goes through the tunnel and you see the little table set up in the tunnel where family members eat after the game in a cold tunnel that I can tell you has those little black boxes on the ground in the corner. You know, those ones that you look at and you go, huh, what's that little black box? What's that do? Rats. I'm eating where you have to put out rat traps. I don't think that's fun. I don't think that's cool. Like, And how about that Pete Carroll story from the late 90s about <laughs> giving the players effing bologna. Sit now, listen, you're talking to somebody who lives to crush up a hand of, handful of ruffles, open up his potato bun, put it in there with the mayo and the mustard and the American cheese and bologna. Like that is high living as far as I'm concerned, says the former fat guy on the pod. But come on, really? I mean, in the age of engineered nutrition and sports science, where you have dudes wearing these man's ears that track the best way that your enzymes break down calories and how you metabolize. We were handing out Fritos and bologna. I mean, it is what it is. Um, so do I think it'll matter? Yeah, I think. And I also think people have painted this as something tied directly into Robert Kraft. Um, I think this is going to resonate more with Jonathan. We all know that Jonathan has taken over more day-to-day -day operations and mm -hmm. I don't know if he deserves some of the blame for this. I don't know if it's some of the people below him that deserve some of the blame for this, which I, I mean, their names are their names. You've done commercials with one of them, Jim Nolan. Like Jim Nolan is part mm -hmm. of the, the, the hierarchy of the Patriots. They make decisions in terms of spending and marketing and construction with Jonathan and others. But the fact that they eat in a tunnel and their weight room is worse than every college, I think, on the planet, every college, those are things that are easily fixable they've done so much construction around there just build an effing ballroom for the families to eat in after the game slap some tvs on the wall throw some tables down and call it a ballroom okay that is a perfect segue line to get into our our next like talking about the dynasty i just wanted to also shoot out there andy real quick um an offer is into kyle duggar or so was confirmed um in the last yeah, 24 the hours offer? i don't well, know i'm just i'm just saying like you know, are, are we going full throttle, uh, you know, Foxborough full throttle? I don't know. But like, I just wanted to put it out there. So in case anyone's curious, listening, engage with us right now. And that is the, the Packer first... way. That is the Packer way that Elliot Wolf looks like he's going down is resign your own players. It was the backbone of the Packers culture forever. Now, it worked really well when you had Hall of Fame quarterbacks. That was part mm -hmm. of the culture as well to have Hall of Fame caliber quarterbacks for like 30 years. So but that absolutely. And Elliot Wolf said it draft, develop, take care of people, treat them the right way. So the burning of the cash could also just be handing out boatloads of cash to Mike Onwenu and Kyle Duggar and Hunter Henry and your own guys. And there goes some of your cap space. Uh, yeah. Of which you still have an absolute blank ton of, of it as well. So, uh, but your line about how uh, things used to be done differently here and getting uh, the Patriots being cheap. And to me, why this is all about optics is a perfect segue to our dynasty talk. Thank you guys for watching on the various portals, social medias and streaming outlets right now. Of course, he's at Jumbo Hart. I am at Fitzy GFY. And this is the six rings and football things podcast where we talked a whole lot of combine the revamp quarterback room and so much more throw us a sub we're available on spotify the odyssey app apple podcast or wherever awesome football talk is found all right here we go time to talk dynasty the apple plus tv series docu series is now six episodes in there are just four to go two more fridays seven more sleeps till you get the next two episodes um and this week andy we were hit with two episodes I believe episode five is called Lost Season, and episode six was At Any Cost. Um, basically, 
uh, the episodes are for better or worse. Uh, forget we're not even worried about the titles, even though we've been told recently that they matter in Foxborough. Do episode they? episode five is the season after Spygate, where of course Tom Brady uh, has his uh, ACL hit by that no good son of a bitch Bernard Pollard in the first game. It's a lost season. It's the Matt Castle season. I found this episode to be very interesting on a number of levels and and actually an enjoyable watch, although it was still frustrating at times. Uh, and then episode six is a very difficult watch. It's an emotional watch and people have strong feelings about it as well. Many of which think that the series is focusing too much on scandals and uh, the negative aspect, if you will. I My big takeaway, Andy, is that you focus on these things like Spygate, like Aaron Hernandez, because it's mesmerizing to me that the New England Patriots were able to keep up a dynasty for 20 years and have a double dynastic run in the face of the two biggest football cheating scandals, even if we think they were garbage of the last 40 years and somebody being accused of three murders and convicted of one. Yeah. I mean, this has to be a big part. Like this is not yes. football story. This is massive sports story in history. I sent you a photo um, which really brought it into light for me during the practice footage, the Aaron Hernandez saga, when Tom Brady's throwing a pass on the practice field to Aaron Hernandez. And in coverage, we have Sergio Brown. Um, <laughs> there were two alleged Awful. murderers on the practice field on a singular, like one visual 38 in blue, 85 in white right next to each other. Like, yeah, you don't think the edit, you don't think the editors knew what they were doing there. I don't know if they did or didn't. And they wanted to, didn't want to like, a lot going on there, but yes, um, the reality is as much as some of us don't like some of the football that's left out, some of the, you know, fast tracking of Super Bowls or details from the AFC title game in 01, like special teams was left out of that. That game was really all about special teams. Why is it about Drew? Well, we're making a movie and we're weaving a narrative here and we're, we're doing some thematic things. Right. Um, and the reality is that the Aaron Hernandez saga is one of the most interesting sagas in the history of of all of sports. Any level, anything, it's 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 that dramatic, and it deserved its time. And it was interesting when you watch it, and the the interviews I continue to say are the best part of this documentary. They like a lot of these guys nailed the hell out of it. Dion Branch working his way through his relationship with chico how, how about the pathos of like like i think uh at least we didn't talk on the pod last week about it but uh over the weekend on the radio talking about how how good i heard you talk with cadillac i spoke with john Lyons about how good freaking scott pioli was as the emotional centerpiece as the narrator dramatic. if you will <laughs> a little dramatic but like that whole drug thing that he talked about like it yep. wasn't about the joy of winning it became a relief because we were addicted to winning in that year and we had a point to prove thought that was tremendous dion branch uh i I thought was unbelievable. Like he feels like he effed up. Like he should have, he wanted to fix and save him and save the team. And he couldn't like, what a great person to choose as your overall focal point for this episode. Um, tying it all together in one Jersey number numbers, 83 early. It was Dion branch. He came back with a different number than Wes Welker was 83. Both of those guys knew exactly what Aaron Hernandez was. And then they saw this. I mean, Wes Welker is like, Bill, why are you, like clearly Bill sold his soul to Aaron Hernandez on the practice field, not trading him flop houses, whatever you want to talk about in terms of the way Bill Belichick handled it. And he had nothing to add. I wouldn't add anything either. Bill just sadly, just let it die with the, the victim, let it die with the suicide, like let it die because the more yeah. you talk, you're, it is what it is. The damage is done, my friend, as the famous quote from recent. Yeah, history. Spygate part two, electric boogaloo. Yes. Um, but even Brandon Lloyd, so little backstory for those that don't know it. Brandon Lloyd has had his own issues with mental health and, and being treated for that and can have some Good. issues at times. Mm -hmm. um, and for him to be the voice of reason and for him to talk about the craziness that was going on with Aaron Hernandez and the way he was in the locker room, I think is also eye opening. But the the biggest issue here to me is Bill and Robert to some degree. If you believe Robert. Like, if you believe, Robert, that he was fully duped, snookered, if he, you know, believed it was going to also questionable quote, the thing when he says, did you do this? If you did, you must have had a good reason. So I'll defend. Excuse me. You like, just I'll assuming? hire the best attorneys. Yes. So there's a point, folks, in what? episode six where Robert Kraft, who hits it, his strikes and stays on board a very somber tone throughout the entire episode. And then we can get to 
uh, the idea of whether or not you think that the craft sell job, the whitewash, if you will, continues because everyone keeps saying that this entire thing is a bag job and a hatchet job on Belichick being painted as the arch villain of the entire dynasty in the series. Um, do you think that do you think that Robert Kraft would have really done something like that? And did he set up Belichick to be the villain in this episode by saying, I tried to help Aaron, but Bill, of course, you know, didn't trade him and wanted to keep him around because that was too much talent. And Bill wanted to get back to winning the way that they used to and take advantage of th what he thought was the end of Brady's prime at that time. Yeah. And this ties into what I've said about the Eric Mangini persona non grata, like, but he's doing everything he thought he needed to do to win. I think they mm -hmm. all do. This gets back to the Pioli comment, the narcotic. I think Bill basically would do anything to win. And I don't say that trying to, you know, vilify him or, cast stone that's his job that is literally his job to find any way he can to win well, the best thing for the football team t-e-a-m team and there's black there's white there's victory there's losing there's a gray area to get there right like there's a you know which yes. boundary will you yes. push and how far will you go and i always say this and no one has ever specifically told me this but i know for a fact hundreds of players over the years had baggage that bill belichick coached could Lawrence Taylor have killed somebody? I don't want to disparage the man, but like on a hopped up, drug-induced, whatever, could something have gone wrong there? Are there other players from 1975 through 2023 where Belichick was like, this guy is having some issues, this guy is struggling, whatever? Mm -hmm. Did they murder anybody? No. So when you live in that world and you go through so many of these personalities and troubled like, I can tell you an example of a local player, Jordan Todman, running back, Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Patriots did a lot of legwork on him coming out of UConn as a 2,000-yard running back, kick right. returner. They feared him being too close to New Bedford, where he grew up, and maybe there being baggage and the wrong people. Uh... And, like, this is a consideration for millions of players that they go – not millions, thousands of players that they go through, and only once – did it turn into, as the ominous um, voiceover guy says, could this be the NFL's first serial killer? Which, by the way, I think of serial killer in a different world. Like, no, he's a he, like he's a I don't, I, I don't know. I, I'm told you can't use the word thug anymore, but like he was just like a he was a he was kind of a low rent criminal who couldn't escape the sins of his past and the people that were bad influences on him. Right. And to your point, and the episode gets into this, and folks, if this is too much spoilerific action. You can tune out, save the pod for later. Listen after you guys watch the episodes this weekend on the Apple TV Plus. But there's a lot made of like Aaron Hernandez would have thrived if he was able to get on a West Coast team. Like in Seattle, he may have had a long career. Who knows? He could have Maybe. found his element out there. Yeah, Oakland, San Francisco. I don't freaking know. I always feel like water finds its own level. Like, geez, Andy, are you going to tell me? Are you going to are you going to tell me that like? Ah, uh, you know, uh, Fitzy just, you know, he loves his craft beers too much. Got to get him out of his house. Got to get him out of the Northeast. He loves those, loves those vitamin C. You telling me that I'm not going to go to Florida, Arkansas, or Montana and find right. a place that makes double dry hopped IPAs? Like, no. Right. And I'm not trying to make light of what Aaron Hernandez did, people. But <laughs> he was too close to the people that became a bad influence. Like, he was on the straight and narrow until his dad dies. His dad kept him in check. And then all hell broke loose, and it became a complete shit show. And it's a, tr it's. If you love storytelling and you love good, like sports stories with pathos, tragedy, drama, excitement, the Aaron Hernandez saga is riveting stuff. It really is. And like the Patriot, like hey, they had a mur he killed somebody and then went back to work and lied to Kraft and lied to Belichick and signed a $40 million deal. Like it's fascinating that the Patriots overcame this. And you're right about Welker and Branch. Again, Branch is so good in this episode. I had heard a different story once from a player who shall not be named where Welker one time was joking with a young Hernandez oh, yeah. um, and said like, hey, rookie, uh, you better bring those pads in. And then, you know, because that's they're all supposed to like take the veterans pads in the locker room. And Hernandez looked at him. He's like, what did you say to me? You bring your own pads in. I'll F you up. And Welker apparently was like, that's I'm done with this guy like that. Matt Light knew he was terrible. Like they all knew. They all knew they all or or they all saw signs. Like, I won't say they knew he was a potential murderer. They knew he was troubled. They knew he was trouble. Troubled and trouble, they all knew, was Aaron Hernandez. And 
yeah, he wanted to be Scarface. He led, and and maybe there can be studies. I'm not a doctor. Like, did he have dual personalities, dual lives, like any of that? Like, I don't know. There was the CTE apparently there. was also very, in addition to the bad environment and whatever maybe. he was predisposed to, the maybe. CTE apparently they believed was very bad. Yeah, and they 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 always believe that about the ones that go bad, and they don't believe that about Matt Light who got hit in the head a lot. They don't, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not all in on the CTE as the get out of, even though I joke about it. Um, it's not a get out of jail. Card. Right. You know, yeah. Fourier, well, Fourier and Wiggy joke about it a lot. Like, like I played football. So that's my get out of jail card. I had a bad helmet. Like, oh, I don't remember anything. Oh, I'm an ass. I almost said a bad word. I'm an a-hole. Like, is that because I had CTE or was I born an a-hole? <laughs> like, I think there's a chance I was born an a-hole. <laughs> you are the great argument for that. I do want to say before we talk a few elements about episode five as well, Matt Castle and the lost season, there was one great moment of levity coming out of the 2010 draft as well. It's early on in the episode. I just think everyone, in case you haven't seen it or you want to hear this, this was great. This is Gronk talking about, from his perspective, uh, what happened on draft night at it when he was taken 42nd overall by the Pats. When I was drafted to the Patriots, it was a proud moment. My family came on stage as well. We got in a huddle. We were doing hoo, 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 hoo in the huddle, jumping up and down. And then all of a sudden, I get a phone call from the Patriots. Hi, Rob. And they said, hey, Rob, like, you can get off the stage now. Like, enough is enough. And I'm sitting there like, wow. I'm already in trouble. It's been five minutes since I've been on the Patriots and I'm already in trouble. I can picture Bill in that draft room just being like, why the fuck did we just draft this kid? Oh, look at this. Lord have mercy. <laughs> the Belichick having, watching Gronk tackling his brothers and Belichick just going, oh, look at this. Lord have mercy. That is just perfect Bill and Gronk. I love it. The funny thing is, I don't know if Gronk cleaned it up or I was told a, a, the wrong story. I was told the very next morning that Bill Bears, whoever called, said, get the F off the stage was mm -hmm. how it was delivered. And I'm surprised Gronk didn't deliver the story in that way. Um, but I was told immediately that that was their reaction. Get the <laughs> F off the stage. Um, and that's another. So, you know, I like to get defensive oh. and, you know, Gronk is my favorite player of all time. Combination of talent coverage. Amazing. He's amazing. Um I actually thought this episode, to make their point about Hernandez and the greatness and the decline, Gronk was the, the great tight end. Hernandez was really good. He was mm -hmm. a slot receiver. He was really good. He was taking over Wes Welker's job, essentially. Um, I thought they kind of glorified mm -hmm. Hernandez to a level that he Gronk was the all-pro. Hernandez was going to be the the Pro Bowl or the the annual decent good guy. He was one of those weapons that they could deploy. Remember, he would take balls out of the backfield on end arounds oh, yeah. and run run for like absolutely. he could do anything. He he like, absolutely he was, so, he was so good. But he was a slot receiver. He was to me this was a a retooling. And in the old days, it was Moss and Welker, and this was going to be Gronk and Hernandez. And Gronk was the all time great, like Moss, and Hernandez was the Welker. Really great. You know, unique talent, can do a lot of things, can produce. I also think, little hashback from the time, I think people scouted Hernandez poorly. You go back and watch. Every time he caught a pass on the hash or the numbers, he cut back to the inside. I don't know why anybody didn't pick up on it. The guys would always fall for it. He would cut back to the inside, and he'd pick up 10 yards after catch. And I'm like, watch a little tape. He always, uh, he absolutely, Nick Chester had alligator arms. He was he was a little soft on the football field. Mm -hmm. And I um, I asked him about it once, and in hindsight, I was an idiot. What are you doing? Wow. What, did you want, did you, like, oh, you think I have alligator arms, mother? Hey, all right. I'm that's I'm definitely um I'm Eric Scalavino. <laughs> I also worked out with him one day at Rodman Gym uh um during the lockout. No I, kidding. Yeah. I look back on that too. Like if I had dropped a weight on him or, or dripped sweat on him, like could he have felt disrespected? Could I be now, on the see? Lift? I was gonna ask you, that's what I wanted to get to. Last thing before we talk a quick castle and wrap it up. Do you have any other like recollections? Because you're there for basically two decades. Like, what were he, what was he nice to you? Did he present one because there were guys talking about the fact that they were always on edge and fearful around him? Now they may be playing that up for the camera, but do you have any other recollections? Um, no, he was always, I think. I mean, his smile, you just have to acknowledge. They said that, you know, when they're shooting that uh, sort of ominous green screen 
opening shot where it's one being mean and one smiling. Um, he had a great smile. He 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 had a genuine, good looking dude. Yeah. Great personality. The dimples like when he wanted to be on, he definitely had an allure to him. I never saw the true craziness. You knew there was an edge a little bit, but I always thought he was like a I say of so many of them, an overgrown teenager, like a immature mm -hmm. two sides yeah. to him and like have an edge. Um, but then I looked, obviously looked back, you know, asking him about having alligator arms and dropping the ball and, and things of that nature, shying away from contact, those types of things. Like at any point, could I have ticked him off the wrong way and, you know, been on some list that he puts together or put, you know, in the back of his head, he's noting things. Um, but no, did I ever think I was dealing with like, there's been guys that came through that locker room that I found much more uh, ominous and fear worthy. And he was not at the top of my list. No. Uh, and why aren't you naming Ted Washington by name? <laughs> uh, well, Ted Washington was a different beast. He was definitely scary. Um, Corey Dillon was a different beast. He was yeah. very scary. He has mellowed. So it's fascinating to see how much he's mellowed over time, but you're not the only one to have ever said like, there's a person I didn't want to get on the wrong side. He of. was a scary MS. He's, he's a big mother effort too. Like he is. Oh, a yeah. Still to this day, it's just like, are shoulders meant to be that big? Yeah, no, he's he's sort of a, a forgotten, remarkable athlete contributor of this whole. Like, he wasn't in here anywhere, right? He has not been mentioned. I don't believe a, I don't think Corey Dillon got a single mention. If you find him no. dynasty, well, like now his career is just about over. Like he was, he broke the record mm -hmm. five years ago in dynasty timeline. Um, also, they get to the point in here where they have the Ravens loss. There's no mention of the the Wes Welker injury that the the blow that took to the team, right? Like, mm -hmm. kind of Wes Welker. Yeah, a lot of those narrative elements are just caught because they're not because they're not doing the book report, as Matthew Hamachek said. I guess, but I know that's but the big. I think people's biggest peccadillo thus far, the the biggest thorn in people's junk on this is the whole like 2003, 2004 was almost done like a montage. Yeah, and and that that's part of it. I also they missed a couple. Um, in the Matt Castle episode, which was, there was a lot of Matt Castle there. There was a, he was a central figure. Mm -hmm. Um, they left out the part that when Bill says Castle says, Bill told me we're not bringing anybody in. You're our guy. That's BS. They had quarterbacks on a plane headed to Foxborough and then they told them to turn around. Bill changed his mind on that, but they initially had, I want to say Tim Rattay. Don't hold me to that, but like they had veteran available quarter street quarterbacks flights were scheduled and they were coming to Foxborough and then he had Nancy Meyer call them back and cancel the flights and turn the flights around or whatever. So no kidding. I would have included that at some point. Yeah. Uh, there is one great quote though. Um, in episode five, not to spoil anything, there was a ton of Matt Castle and he deserves it because it was a great season and it still pisses me off that they went 11 and five and didn't make the postseason. Uh, Castle recounts this story about meeting up with Belichick in the film room. Quote, one time I didn't see a corner blitz and I get absolutely annihilated. Belichick comes in and he says, Castle, can we figure out the corner blitz? Because I don't want to have to write your mother a letter that says, Dear Mrs. Castle, we're sorry to inform you that your son is dead because he's a dumbass and didn't see the corner blitz. Yeah, that's a good quote. That's phenomenal. That is a phenomenal, phenomenal quote. Um, and it's very I, Belichickian, having a little military yep. spin to it. Yep. Um, Randy Moss, once again, dynamite, so electric on camera, can't ever get enough of him. Um, five is good. And, but I do think they, I did think they introduced the, like, this is where Brady starts getting it. Like, am I going to get replaced? I'm going to have to like Brady asked if he could play without an ACL. Belichick said, no, you know, I did the same thing in high school. You played through, you tried to play through an ACL. Yeah. They wouldn't let me, <laughs> <laughs> they were but like did you try to come back so quickly that you got, um, you do, that you got an infection and they had to I go back not. in and yeah no, I, for, I, I forgot about Neil Elatrosh having Atrache. to go back in Atrache. having and to go back all in these years I've been kind of blaming him for it and uh Brady took full credit for effing it up and I yep. give him credit for doing that on the record in a situation like this that he good for him up. yeah um Castle's great uh Moss is great in the episode it's definitely a what could have been but it kind of sets up again one of those moments Spygate the uh, Brady ACL and Castle, then Hernandez, all these moments where the dynasty teeters on just crapping out and somehow they continue to thrive and survive. So 
Um, any last thoughts on those two episodes or just in general before we wrap it up? Atrache. Well, I did think the comments from the various uh, Brady Sr., Drew, Kraft, sort of acknowledging mm -hmm. that this was Tom's first taste or, or scare of being replaced and being mortal football-wise, even though we feel like, wow, that was a long time ago. The career he had after that 08 injury is ridiculous. Just the acknowledgement that he felt that. And you tie that into something, for example, the famous Edelman Welker sideline. Hey, Welker, you ever hear a Wally Pip and that whole situation like competing? Tom felt a little and insecurity can be a good thing. It can drive mm -hmm. people to be very um, hardworking and motivated and do. And it's interesting that even Tom Brady, after three Super Bowl titles, a perfect regular season, rewriting the record books in the, all the passing numbers of 07, had some insecurity. It's good to feel like Tom Brady every once in a while. Even he can be insecure. <laughs> With his perfect hair that is like probably took hours to style to get it just so it looks like he got out of bed. Oh, when and, he uh, sits there, it really is. It really is remarkable. It's a but he has, you know, I, I have purposely not finished it because I don't want to be so far ahead that it's not as fun to play along with everyone, but. I got to say, he's pretty upbeat. He seems in a good place with whenever he sat down and spoke with the crew. He seems to be in a pretty good place with all of this now. Like, we should all, yeah. whether we've gone through breakups or not, had any acrimony. If you've ever had that level of success, maybe you could appreciate it. But I like where Brady is in all this. It's unfortunate, though, that it seems like Robert Kraft wants to retell a lot of the story. And Belichick is obviously very frustrated with how he's portrayed and where he is. But, um, I'm with you. You said right before we get going on the live pod here today, it's fun. Like, like you, you'll have, you'll disagree with editorial choices. You will quibble with narrative er elements and the way that they edit stuff out of, um, sort of out of sync or, and futz right. with the timeline. They'll overlook some things. The, like this found footage is incredible. These testimonials and interviews are gold. I love it. And that's just because I, I can't get enough. I remember the games. I re so do you. You don't need someone to tell you how you should have felt about all this stuff. But this is all the extra filler that you haven't had a chance to, to engage with before. So that's my big takeaway. I'm still loving it. Yeah. And that, I mean, you should love it. You're the Foxborough fanboy. I'm, what do you call me? The gridiron Grinch. Uh, I'm supposed to hate it. I'm not mm -hmm. supposed to love these types of no, things. The, or the gridiron. Would you prefer gridiron grouch? I don't, the, I think the negativity is all uncalled for. I think I'm miscast and I am being vilified the way Bill Belichick is being vilified. It is not fair. And I know how he feels. Our okay. greatness is being questioned for no reason. All right. Wait, what? So ladies and gentlemen, he is uh wildly misunderstood. That's <laughs> a jumbo heart. Got a little typo in there. <laughs> misunderstood. <laughs> all right. I was rushing. Okay. I'm producing. I'm co-hosting. Come on. Um, it's a great watch. It's up now. Uh, next week, you'll have two more episodes, two more Fridays with two episodes. Uh, and maybe we'll have a chance in a couple of weeks to have Hamachick and Benedict on to have a final, like, why'd you make those choices and how do they feel about the feedback that they've received? Because I know they appreciate the fact that we've discussed it so much. And it's been a live part of this wild offseason for Pats Nation. All right, Andy, we talked about the revamp quarterback room, combine nuggets, uh, which veteran quarterbacks you like, burning or saving cash, Wolf of Ball Street. Uh, the dynasty, anything else you want to get to, or should we wrap her up? Oh, I think we should wrap this up. This might be the longest podcast we've ever done. We're at an hour and four minutes coming up. <laughs> I enjoyed it thoroughly though. It just flew by. Hey, Nick Chester. Thanks for watching and participating. We love your comments along the way. Love the show. Thank you very much. Tell your friends. This is a live wire of a community. <laughs> I didn't He's call you dumb, Jeff. I said, <laughs> your idea was dumb. There is a difference. <sighs> And as Andy always likes to say, he is both not for everyone and the truth is never mean. All right, for a jumbo heart, for our producer, Justin Turpin, and everyone at WEI, this is your old pal, Nick Fitzy Stevens. We'll be back next week with post-combine buzz, more draft talk. We'll try to sneak in one of these a week during the offseason because it's a fun place to get together and shoot the breeze and or the fluff and shit together. Whoa, whoa. Uh, thank you very much. All right. We said it a couple times during the episode. Hey, we love what you do, Mary Beth Campbell Bayon. Thank you for she tuning in die. as well. Love okay. what you guys die. Okay. <laughs> she left off the D. All right. I apologize for nothing. That's it. That's <laughs> He's Hart. I'm Fitzy. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Good day. God bless. Thanks for tuning in to Six Rings. And as Bye. always, go Pets.